Hey there, you wild apes. Uh, this is part 5A, lecture 5A. We're going to go over a little bit of conservation of biodiversity and how organisms fit into their biomes, how human beings begin to interact with them. And we're going to look at some of the things that made our biomes the way they are, right? At which, um, why they are the way they are um, based on, based on the, the climates and the, the conditions there and how that gives rise to, to organisms that, that live in those areas naturally and then how they adjust over time to those, uh, those biomes, okay? So let's go ahead and look at that. All right, first off. All right, levels of diversity in ecosystem diversity, the variety of ecosystems uh, within a given region, okay? Um, species diversity, the variety of species in a given ecosystem, so these are all terms that you need to know, and genetic diversity, the variety of genes within a given species. So these are three different ways look at diversity, okay? So three different ways. You've got one, ecosystem, two, species, and then three, variety of genes within a given species. Okay, so all these things are important because they lead to the overall um, ability for organisms and ecosystems to thrive when changes occur, such as human interaction or natural disasters. All right, so here's our ecosystem diversity, right? Because it's different on one side, the windward side versus the leeward, it gives rise to different species. And within those species, you have different genetic diversity, right, which gives rise to different um, phenotypical traits, morphological traits. All right. All right. Measuring biodiversity. Um, the number of species in a given area is the most common measure of biodiversity. They can take like a little section. So if I have like all of Texas, okay, it's a really horrible Texas, you know, um, I might get like a swath of Texas that maybe goes like this. Because why would I want to go this way and not this way? Right? Because the different latitude range we get different climates, right? So what they'll do is if I have like a pond, a pond might be a better example. Um, I might just get like a small portion of the pond somewhere that kind of cuts through something. And then I would multiply that by the volume and hopefully get something like that. And scientists estimate that there are approximately 10 million species on Earth. Um, actually, they said that there were something like 500 million is like the most liberal estimate. And they, a lot of people think that's a little too high. All right, uh, moving on. So this is important. Biodiversity locally can be described as species richness, the number of species in a given area, and species evenness. The evaluation of an ecosystem to determine if one species dominates or if all species are represented equally. So look at this right here. Um, so you see these different types of trees, A, B, C, and D. And if you count them up, you notice that they all are in the same proportion, right? So this right here would have good species richness, right? If we're we're looking at the number of plants relative to this area. They have about the same species richness. They have the same number of types of plants, right? A, B, C, and D. But you see the evenness in community one is a lot better because it has a 0.25 ratio, right? That means that if I were to put all of the number of species for D over the total, so D over the sum of all of them, so A through D, I would get, so this is a range, okay? That's not minus D. I would get 0.25. That's what that's what they're doing here, and this is important because in a couple days we're going to do a lab called Shannon's Index. The Shannon's Index, which measures species diversity, which measures the overall diversity of an area, um, and it takes into account both the evenness and the um, richness. Okay, and so if you look, even though this right here has the same um, species richness, this would actually have more biodiversity. There would be more biodiversity in this one because it's more even. So that's important, um, and it's it's important that the that the biodiversity is really high because when you have high biodiversity, you have high fit, you have a, a high ability of this biome to resist change and to and to come back from really bad things that happen. To it. Okay, so that's important. The biodiversity is the change is the result of evolution. This is very important. So the amount of evolution that occurs in a species helps to the overall biodiversity when things change, right? So microevolution is what happens below the species level. And macroevolution is what gives rise to the species. Right? So you can look these things up, make sure you, you're, you have these down. All right, mutations. These are important mutations. They're random changes in the genetic code that improve an organism's chance of survival and reproduction. This is if, 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 if it is a beneficial if it is beneficial. Because there are lots of mutations that can lead to immediate species death. There are mutations that can lead to the inability for an organism to 
you know, come to term what ends in the emb embryological stage. But you have some mutations that are accidentally really, really nice, right? And you have some other mutations like the a parrot in a forest, right? A parrot, a parrot um, is usually green, but it has some sort of recessive trait that makes it blue, right? So look at the background of this. So if I have a bunch of green birds, right? Right, these are little feet. Right, really bad bird. So I have all these birds. This one blends in, but if you notice, I, you know, if I have an accidental little blue bird here, he's flying. It's a blend. So, blend. Okay. Now this guy stands out a lot better, so he's gonna get eaten. Okay. So this is not necessarily a fatal mutation, but it's definitely something that doesn't help its cause. Right. All right. Recombination. Uh, sexual reproduction in organisms require an exchange of chromosomes pieces during meiosis leading to new combination of genes. So think about this real quick. If mutations can be good for diversity, and I need to recombine genes in order to do that, or I need to recombine during meiosis, right? Um, it would be to my benefit to have a high number of organisms, right? Because the more I have, the more recombination I have within a species, and then the more reproduction I can have later on. Right? Artificial selection, this is when humans determine which individuals breed. Here are examples, broccoli, um, antibiotics, create resistant bacteria. Okay, so we have things, these are these are um, purposeful artificial selection. Things like this and dogs, right? they all come from wolves. Um, these things we did on purpose. Um, and we didn't do the antibiotic resistant thing on purpose, right? The same thing with pesticides, having pesticide resistant uh, pests, right? Um, these happen because of biodiversity and species richness, right? So the more bacteria we have, the likelier over a long period of time, so if I increase the amount of time, there's a higher probability, higher probability that I will eventually find that one teeny incy uh, organism that is just a little bit resistant to this antibiotic. Those guys will become more successful. They will be able to reproduce, and they'll pass on their genes. And then guess what? Over a period of like thousands of years, and in the case of bacteria, they have smaller time scales, right? They'll be able to develop um, antibacterial resistance, right? So these things are still artificial selection, even though we did not conscientiously try to do this. So that's very important. Okay, those are these are two ways to kind of differentiate artificial selection and natural selection. The environment determines which individuals are most likely to survive and reproduce. So this is over a very, very long period of time normally with big organisms, with um, viruses, bacteria. It's not, not, as, not as long. Okay. Fitness, this is a very important term. The combination of traits that allow for survival. And what I want you to think about for this, if we look back, this one over here, is it leads, fitness is for reproduction, really. Because it's if it allows it to survive, we're not talking about just the short term, we're talking about long term. So I want you to connect this to reproduction. So think about it like that. Alright, let's talk about ways that um, genes can be mixed between populations. Okay, you have genetic drift. So random mating affects genetic composition of a population. So in a large population, it remains the same. In a small population, some genotypes may be lost just because you may have some instances when you have five mice, right? So here's here's the small population. You don't have enough, obviously, within a within a mating season or a mating cycle for I mean you can't pair all these off, right? There's not gonna be, you know, two pairs and then one mouse reproduces as you know asexually. You know, that doesn't happen. So one of them's just gonna get left out. And if it just happens that I have, you know, a, a black mouse and four white mice and the black mouse doesn't get to reproduce, guess what's gonna happen? He's gone, right? So small populations are extremely vulnerable things like change, right? If any sort of um, detrimental thing happens, the smaller population of animals um, are going to are going to be adversely affected more than large populations. So this goes back to genetic diversity and how it, it's favored by large populations. Large populations are good for biodiversity. Okay? The bottleneck effect. Um, this is when a population suddenly decreases in size. This is this could be from you know, extreme habitat destruction, whether it be human or natural. Um, what will end up happening is you'll have a huge decrease in the population. And now you've got a small population. It goes back to this scenario here. Okay? And it always leads to a little bit less, less biodiversity. Right? Uh, 
that's important. What's going to happen to the overall fitness? It's going to decrease her. Because now it's not going to be able to adapt to new changes. And I don't mean just like suddenly, but over time, right over time. And what can end up happening is my time goes up. If there isn't anything that kind of remediates the situation, you're going to end up with a extinction or really you're going to endanger the species. You're going to lose some of the species. All right. When all of these different types of ways that genes mix and, and the different problems that we have, we're going to talk about these and we're going to do little activities with these. So if you're not quite understanding the difference between some of these, that's okay. We're going to go over it. All right. The founder effect. Um, a few individuals from a mainland colonize an island. And you've seen this with uh, different birds and stuff. People study birds and they find that like, they have, different, um, phenot they have phen uh, different phenotypical expressions right, based on small populations moving somewhere else. And what you end up happening here is you always kind of want to go back to just kind of the small population scenario where if you ever have an isolated small population, they're not taking, they are not going to take all of their genes with them. If they don't take all of their genes with them, what's going to happen? Well, they're not going to have the same amount of uh, gene pool. And they're not going to maintain the biodiversity. They're going to end up just developing whatever they had. That's how you end up with, and I know this is kind of a bad um, analogy, but if you can imagine people that speak with an English accent moving to different parts of the world, they don't take every aspect of that, the, the, the motherland of England um, accent. So those accents get kind of funny when you go to the, when you go to New Zealand, right, or or if you go to like Australia, right, right, like they get slightly different weird accents. You know, or even like our old Bostonian Harvard accent at, at some point used to be an English accent, if you think about it, right? So that's kind of weird, right? Um, just moving, moving and having a founder effect, you're taking just a few aspects of the original gene pool and now you end up with some, some funky talking. Um, I just kind of want you to relate that to your biomes and think about what happens when your biomes change, right? These guys are based on latitude, right? So all of our species develop to adapt to that latitude, right? They adapted to that latitude. So if we change the nature of this, like if we, if we mess up the trees, we are now making this biome different, right? So these animals that adapted to this latitude now are going to decrease, right? The overall number of that population can decrease. And if we don't have good genetic diversity, they will no longer be able to keep adapting to that, those changes, right? And they'll end up disappearing. Right? These guys will all disappear. So think about it like that. Um, relate this stuff and the ability to have high populations and high genetic diversity. Um, relate that to how biomes can change and how climates change. And um, that's that's kind of the way you should kind of be focusing on this for FRQs. And we'll, we'll get into the more of this as we get into the next part. We get into um, niches, and jobs, and stuff like that, and specializations, um, extinction events, human interaction. Um, so think about how these animals interact with the environment and how we change the environment and how, how that affects this overall process.